we were developing our plans for this series, one of the observations we made early on had to do with this gadget right here, the portable gas-driven chainsaw. The chainsaw is selling in greater numbers than ever before as more and more weekend woodcutters head to the Yankee woodlot to process firewood for the home stove or furnace. Along with the increased sales, another number has been rising, that of serious accidents attributed directly to the operation of the chainsaw and its use in the woods. Sonny Rollins and Greg O'Leary are two instructors at the Washington County Vocational Technical Institute in Calais, Maine. These professional loggers are part of one of the most respected wood harvesting programs in the country. In their classes, students are trained to become professional loggers, knowledgeable in many aspects okay, of wood harvesting. Now, we spent a day with Greg and Sonny discussing some basic procedures wood lot owners should keep in mind when beginning to operate the chainsaw. Since the program's emphasis is on safety, Greg began with a discussion of safety equipment every woods operator should use when setting out to work with the chainsaw. Okay, what we have laid out here on this bench is basic safety items that everyone should have when they go in the woods, be it a first a man, the first time out, or an experienced professional. We have two helmets here. This first helmet is a standard helmet. It's equipped with ear muff protection. Uh, well, these chainsaws are quite quiet, but if you uh, run them any period of time, it can affect your hearing. This has the ear muffs that flip down over your ears to protect your ears. Now, these two helmets are basically the same with the exception, this one has a screen which flips up and down when you're using the saw to keep the chips and so on out of your eyes. You should always have ear protection or eye protection. Some people use this, other people use, if you uh, wear prescription glasses, they have safety lenses that shatter, you know, they will break, but they won't shatter, so this is adequate eye protection. There's, you know, there's several different types of eye protection you can get. This is just one of them. If you're bothered by fine dust or sawdust, you'd probably want to go with the screen. Right. If it was, you know, if it was, you know, getting to a point was bothering you any amount, you'd probably go with the screen. And this, again, is equipped with the ear mouths. Now, a lot of people don't go with the ear mouths. They have a little item here. This is uh, one pair. It's ear protection. These are little units that you simply roll them in your fingers. They will shrink up. Very small. You place them in your ears, and then they expand and mu uh, muffle the sound of the saw and the tractor, whatever you happen to be driving. These are very inexpensive. You can pick them up at any safety equipment store. And uh, Can you use those time and time again? You can use them over and over again. The only problem this time of year, fly dope on them will tend to deteriorate them. Yeah. But now, other than that, they can be used over. That ear protection just takes out the high whine. We can still talk in a regular voice and hear. Yes. You can hear reasonably well. It does hamper your hearing somewhat, but uh, you can still communicate you know, quite adequately. So, so we got a hat and ears and eyes. Uh, how right. about moving down now? Okay, here we have, these are cutting gloves, safety gloves, whatever you want to call them. This glove here is just a regular glove. See, I cut myself on the chains already. So that's why the cutting gloves <laughs> Be careful, huh? We should have had the gloves on to start right. with. Now this glove here is for your left hand, and statistics prove that about 80% of your injuries with a chainsaw occur to the left side of your body, left leg, and left arm and hand. This has got two-ply ballistic nylon padding into it. Now this won't necessarily eliminate a chainsaw cut, but it will greatly reduce one where you would have a severe cut, this may prevent it or reduce it where it will be very, very minor. Uh, that ballistic nylon, is that like the stuff in a bulletproof vest? Very similar stuff, yes. This nylon is woven in such a manner that as the teeth, cutting teeth on your chain grips it, it pulls it into the sprocket and binds the chain up. You know, it almost fluffs right out, and when it catches in the sprocket, it simply binds the chain up and stops the chain from turning. And like I say, it doesn't necessarily completely eliminate it, but it will greatly reduce it. Now, you have some ballistic nylon in here, too? OK, these here are cutting chaps. This is, again, ballistic nylon. This, they call them chaps. They're similar to the old riding chaps of the Wild West days. This is, again, ballistic nylon. And this is for leg protection. Mm -hmm. Right down the front? Right down. They buckle on right around your waist and around your legs. Mm -hmm. and this. Again, I will reduce or stop a chainsaw cut.
These hold it tight to my leg. So that I straps right around your leg and holds it into place. Now, these we use quite, uh, quite often. You can buy the ballistic nylon patches. They're uh, not made like this. They don't strap on. They're a patch about like this that can be sewn onto your cutting pants. Some of them have snaps that will snap right onto your cutting pants. Other uh, people take them and they'll have their cutting pants. They'll have pockets sewn inside, have their wives or girlfriends, whatever, sew pockets. So the ballistic nylon pad will slide right into it and they'll just pin the top and hold it into place. Mm -hmm. And then they can take the pads out, wash the pants, and uh, just slip the pads back into it. Are the uh, chaps or nylon pads pretty important? Do you see a lot of cuts on the legs that are prevented by the pants? Oh, uh, an awful lot of cuts. Uh, you know, I've seen it, uh, especially with students and first uh, time, you know, first time operators of a chainsaw, that uh, as many as three and four times a day, with we'll say, well, with 15 new people, that'd be three or four of them will cut into these chaps with a saw and won't cut themselves. So very important. Very, very important. I recommend it for anyone going out, especially first time out. What about uh, foot protection? This boot here, and there's all different manufacturers of steel-toed safety boots. You can buy them about anywhere, very common, all different brands and makes and models. The protection here, the big thing, is the steel toe. Now, not so much for a chainsaw cutting through the toe of it, but if you're cutting firewood, four-foot wood, whatever, a lot of times you're piling wood, throwing it on a truck, someone has thrown it out to the road, a stick will hit on your foot, break your foot, you know, break your toes, uh, you'll see weekend woodcutters with toe, toenails black falling off and so on. This is basically protect your toes, which your know, toe is one of your uh, high accident areas, especially on a firewood operation. How about the safety features on a saw like this one? This saw is equipped with the chain brake assembly. On this particular saw, and most of them are made basically the same, we'll just move this helmet so we can look at it. What this chain brake does, this is a, it's a band around your sprocket and your clutch. What it's for, most of your accidents occur in the woods are due to kickbacks. When you're sawing a tree or a log, the end of that chain hits another log or a limb. It'll kick back at you. This chain brake, when it kicks back, your wrist hits it and snaps the chain brake on. This chain brake, if it's working effectively, will stop the chain in about one-tenth of a second. Now that kickback quite often occurs right in this. It occurs right usually hitting something right on the tip of your bar. And like I say, kickbacks, you go out in the woods working, you'll feel them quite often during the day. Most of the time, you're ready for it, you're standing. When it kicks back, you simply stop it. As for that big kickback, when this hand is not you know, holding on the saw tightly. When it kicks back, you know, you may slip. You may get hit in the face with the saw but at least the chain won't be turning. And, you know, you still may have an accident, but it certainly won't be a bad cut. That pretty well takes care of, you've got your helmet, your cutting chaps, your cutting gloves, your saw is in good operational condition, sharp, you're ready to go to work. And, you know, the safety equipment, you've got to have it, and you've got to use your head along with it. What's between your ears? What's between your ears helps. You know, all the protection in the world can't stop an accident if you don't know how to use it. Sonny, we're in the Yankee woodlot here and looking for some trees to cut. Uh, maybe if we cut this uh, aspen, we can improve the uh, rest of the stand a little bit. How would you go about getting this one down? Okay, this is a nice looking aspen, popple. The first thing we would do would be survey the top of this tree, look it over to see which way the top leans, also to see if there's any dead wood up there or stubs around that could interfere with the felling of the tree or anything that could fall back and hurt us. If there was a stub or a dead limb, a big dead limb, what would you do? Well, if there was a dead limb, there wouldn't be too much you could do about it, except keep your eye on it some and watch it when the tree fell. Yeah. If there's any stubs in the immediate area, in the immediate area yeah. the stubs would be the first trees that you should cut down. Cut them down, fell them, get them out of your way before you start. Cutting this particular tree right here, you see we have two small white maple that are more or less in the way of the tree. Now, we could cut those true white maple first, but good cutting practices, they're good growing trees, we'd like to leave those. 
So what we'd do was try to follow this poplar or aspen down by the two white maple and leave them. You if think we they'll go by there? I by? think so. Yeah. Now, if they don't, later on we could always cut the two white maple, but it'd be better to leave them if at all possible. Now, we have some brush here around the bottom of the tree. Of course, we'd want to move this brush, get a good chance to work around the tree, and always plan an escape route from the tree once the tree starts to fall. Now, this is a, an excellent chance right here because we have an open area to run back away from the tree. OK, that's your escape route. If there were small trees in the area, we would cut these trees and move the brush so we had a good chance to move back away from the tree once the tree starts to fall. Now, we, you always want the escape route so you can go more or less off at a 45 degree angle. 45 degree angle, right. all right. By going directly away from the tree, the tree sometimes kicks back over the stump and will follow you back. Uh, also, as you move away from it, you want to keep your eyes on the tree and the dead wood and whatever. If you're moving directly away from it, you can't see that too good. Moving off to the side would be bad because like this tree here, if it should roll out of these two small white maple, it might roll directly at you. So good clear escape route, 45 degrees. More or less off 45 degrees, if at all possible. Well, either from this side of the tree or from that side. As long as you plan your escape route ahead, well, you're pretty well set. All right. OK, the next thing would be is to make the undercut or the notch in the base of the tree. Basically, we have two undercuts that we can put in the tree. On both of them, you make the undercut into about a third of the diameter of the tree itself. Now, you can win the horizontal cut first, about a third of the way, and then come down with a diagonal cut to meet it, to take the pie shaped out. Mm-hmm, all right. It's going to be and, a pie shaped cut to make. Right. And uh, most of your older cutters, they have done it this way. Now, the newer way, which probably is the better way, is you make the diagonal cut down first. Then when you make the horizontal cut, you can visually look down the diagonal cut and you can see your saw blade when it meets the diagonal cut. So it's a better chance to see just exactly what you're doing. Right. OK. Now, this notch that is taken out of here, this undercut that is taken out, it should face the direction of the fall of where you want the tree to go. All this right. is what's going to guide it. This gap in the tree and the hinge behind it is going to guide the tree down to the ground. So maybe if we go ahead and make that notch now, we can get an idea of, of what you're explaining to us. OK. made our diagonal cut, we've made a cut in, and our hinges come out, which is about a third of the diameter of the tree or less. And in doing so, you see, we overshot just a little bit. Just a little bit by there. Just a little bit by. We have to keep this in mind once we've cut the tree down. If this had been perfect, both of these cut would have met right perfect. OK. Not every time is perfect. Sir. Not every time is perfect. All right. In a way, this was good. We can show you what, we, what you shouldn't do. All right. Now, when we cut this tree down, make the bat cut, we should keep good hinge wood. By hinge wood, I'm talking about wood that we don't cut. All right. We cut the back of this tree, clear through, and we leave a section here in the middle to guide the tree down. Hinge wood that is left right there. All right. In no way should we cut this tree completely off. So that. That wood that you leave, that hinge, is going to kind of control the tree. Guide the fall of the tree. And, and direct where it's going to go. Right. OK. Now, how do we position this other cut that we're going to make here, this back cut? All right. This back cut should be anywhere from level with this cut here, this horizontal cut, up to an inch or an inch and a half higher. At no time should you have the back cut below this 
horizontal cut of the notch. Okay, so the back cut's got to be above the notch. Just a little bit above the notch. You don't want it too much, but just a little bit okay. above the notch. So we can. Let's go ahead and make, make that back cut. Make the back cut. I'll move that uh, axe out of your way. Probably, do you want it right there, or is you need yeah, that axe right that's there? Yeah, that's okay, right there. Anyway. All right. Greg, can you explain limbing to us? Well, there is you know, proper ways to limb a tree. The biggest problem you have with the beginning woodcutter is they tend to be a little bit afraid of their saw. Now, the thing is, you don't want to be afraid of it, but you've got to have some respect for it. Because it is a tool, it's simply an extension of yourself if you know how to use it right. If you don't know how to use it, and people beginning don't, they tend to be a little bit afraid of it. They try to get it out away from them as far as they can. When they do this, the whole weight of the saw is absorbed by the arms. Now, there's very few people around today that can hold that saw out for any length of time. I mean, so. Maybe the maximum. The thing to limit tree, you've got to use your legs to support the weight of the saw. You use the stem of the tree to support the weight of the saw. And you'll start, usually if you limit this side, use your knee you cut the limbs on this side, you're using this knee to support the saw. Up this side. Get the limbs on the top of the tree. You lay your saw on the side. The weight of the saw is supported by the bar itself. All you're doing, or your arms are doing, is balancing the saw. Very little bit of effort in your arm. Cut the limbs off. You want to get the limbs off of the opposite side of the tree. And this here again, if the tree is down flat on the ground, as this one is here, You'll, again, use your knee. If the tree is up off the ground a couple of feet, you'll actually let the saw ride right on the tree. And all you do is use your arms to sweep the saw along with the tree. So anywhere you can, you're trying to transfer the weight to something else so you don't have to lug it. Transfer the weight to your legs or to the tree. Your legs are much stronger than your arms. They can usually take it all day if you know, time it, and pace yourself. Also, when you're limbing a tree, you always limb on the left side of the tree, starting from the butt of the tree. Now, chainsaws are Your feet, to, you stand your feet on the left side of the tree. Feet on the left side of the tree because of the design of the chainsaw. You want to keep the motor part of the saw towards your body. That puts the barn chain that much farther away from you. If I was to switch to this side of the tree and I would have to switch hands, I would be going left-handed. If I be limbing this tree, the motor portion of the saw is away from me. The barn chain is next to me, much closer to my legs and my body. If I try to use my legs to support it, I'm in trouble. So if you're on this side of the tree, you can use your legs to support it. You have approximately a foot of motor and so on, and that keeps it that much farther away. You can bend your knees, you can lean. Anytime you lean, you've got that safety factor, the distance across that saw. And like I say, you'll just limb up back, using the, supporting the weight of the saw on either your legs or the tree. Sounds good. Now, occasionally you'll have to, you may want to, you may have to reach out and get a limb on occasion, but any time possible, support. When you limb the bottom, my hand is laying, resting right on my knee. So the weight, very little weight on my arm and cut the bottom limbs off the tree. Good. It's all in position, in good footing, and balance. You have to kind of watch your footing because you can get tangled up if you're not yeah. careful. You don't want to make a, any cut with that saw being accelerated unless your foot, your feet are in good positions. Knees bent slightly, get your center of balance a little bit lower. Then if your saw does kick, you've got a better position to hold it from getting to you. I'll start the saw up and I'll give you a short demonstration here of what I mean.
There was a lot more Sonny and Greg could have demonstrated for us. But by this time, you should understand the operation of a chainsaw is not a simple chore. It requires proper instruction and careful, knowledgeable technique. So please be careful. And as Greg said, it's what's between your ears that really counts. You have to think safety. As a weekend woodcutter, one of the hardest and probably most frustrating jobs you will face is the movement of your timber from the stump to roadside, where you can load it into a truck for hauling. It's a serious problem for the woodlot owner, who obviously is not going to invest in a large skidder, or may not even wish to have a large machine like that working the woodlot. It's also a problem which has been getting a great deal of attention from the School of Forest Resources and the Department of Agricultural Engineering here at the University of Maine at Orono. Ben Hoffman is one of the people directly involved in researching practical solutions to this problem. And we spoke to him one wet and rainy afternoon while he and his assistants were conducting some experimental work in the Yankee woodlot. Well, usually the problem is getting the wood from the woods to whatever they're going to haul it in. In many cases, it's just a pickup truck or a small farm truck. And there, there's several ways of solving it. If the woodlot owner is a farmer, he usually has a small tractor, some kind of a tractor. If he isn't, then he may have some problems. Are there, are there particular kinds of tractors or accessories he should look for that if he uh, doesn't have something, he's going to go buy one? Well, there are a number of uh, four-wheel drive, small four-wheel drive tractors on the market now that are this diesel like powered. Right this is one. Yeah. This is made in, in Italy. There are a number made in Japan, some in England. I don't believe there are any made in the United States. What's the horsepower of this one? This is 21 horsepower. This is, oh, a medium-sized small tractor, I guess. Yeah. Four-wheel drive. Four-wheel drive. This one is articulated. And most of the farm tractors, uh, this is a farm tractor, incidentally, but it is articulated. And most of the farm tractors don't hinge in the middle. Now, yours have got a special device on I've got a winch there. on the back, which uh, is used for pulling logs out of the woods to the tractor to keep the tractor on the trail. And the trail is somewhat easier to drive on. It's pretty rough, but it's still easier than driving in the woods. The most important thing is if you keep the machinery on a trail, you don't damage the root systems of the trees or bang the trees up. So by working here, you're protecting your forest. Right, right. Uh, ben, you developed a little machine that's really pretty interesting. It kind of looks like a wheelbarrow with a little uh, winch cable on it. Can you uh, get a name for it, and uh, how does it work? Well, that was developed by uh, Professor Norman Smith in the Department of Agricultural Engineering. And it started out because it only had one wheel. I think he called it the one-legged horse, but it's now known as the Yankee Yarder, which is a, just a three-horsepower lawnmower engine, really, with a small winch, which could do the same job as this tractor. We, uh, we normally think when we log in the woods of using big skidders, or here we're talking about 21 horsepower. Now you're going to do the same thing with three horsepower. How does that, uh, how does that come about? Well, you have to. Uh, you either use brains or you use horsepower. <laughs> and when you're using a small machine like that, you've got to, you just can't pull anything out of the wood, so you have to use your smarts a little. And uh, what we do is hang the block for the winch high in the tree. Right. In fact, we've used a ladder to get up 10 or 15 feet. And then the winch cable is pulling up in this direction on the load, so it kind of lifts the front end of it off the ground. So that eliminates a lot of the friction and obstacles that you run into when you're winching the way we are here. The other thing we do is use some of these skidding aids. The uh, pans, an old Volkswagen hood is probably uh, the best thing if you can pick one up at the junkyard cheap. And if you put your wood on that, it acts just like a, a sled. Getting Makes it slide along so it doesn't oh, drag yes. in the dirt. Now that must yeah. improve the forest too, uh, or not, oh, yes. not destroy the forest. Reduces uh, the amount of damage that you have to the root systems. Now, there's a, another device, a little two-wheeled uh, rig that you were working with that's hand-powered or could be hand-powered. Yeah, that's like a rickshaw. On a rickshaw, the, yeah, all right. Or like a racing sulky that you see at the racetrack. Yeah, for horses it's uh, two second-hand motorcycle tires and a little bit of steel and some welding, and we made a, a uh, it, well, it looks really like a racing sulky, except it has one shaft instead of two. There's one fellow logging around here that uses one with two shafts with a horse, but ours we designed primarily for uh, a person or even a couple of people or a garden tractor. And 
as you tip the thing back, mm -hmm. the uh, top gets down to the ground, you chain your log onto it, and then as you tip it back up, your wheels pick your load right up off the ground. So your load is clear of the ground. Your load is clear of the ground. In fact, you should, when we first designed it, we thought the smart thing to do is pick up one end of the log and drag the back end. But we found that the really smart thing to do is pick up the whole log, pick it up free of the ground, and then you have no dragging resistance, it's all rolling. For someone who's cutting firewood that needs to get it from the stump to the road with a minimum investment, that's a very effective way to do it. On our next program, we'll discuss an area of woodlot management some Yankee woodlot owners found to be rewarding and others have described as a disaster, the commercial sale of timber products. That's it for this time. I'm Bud Blumenstock. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time in the Yankee woodlot. Woodlot was produced by the main public broadcasting network, which is solely responsible for its content. And was made possible in part by a grant from International Paper Company.